All right, uh, so it appears we're just the three of us here. I'm going to ask that maybe we give them some five to 10 minutes. Maybe if we have uh, at least five, five people. So if we have three more joined, then we can start. I hope you're all fine though. Yeah, that's, that's fine. All right, thank you.
All right. Uh, so I suppose we can we can start. I see we have uh, the six of us now. I don't know if the rest are going to <clears throat> to join us. Uh, maybe at a later stage, perhaps we can sit down and uh, try and explore the possibility of maybe say starting at uh, quarter two, so seventeen forty-five as opposed to seventeen thirty. Um, if, if that would be more convenient. Although it, it, it poses a bit of a challenge when we, we start inviting, um, so industry-based speakers especially, uh, the last thing we'd want to do is to, to tie them to this sort of schedule where they say start at 7.45 and then go all the way up to uh, after 18 or something. But we can, we can try that. I mean, if we, I've, I've noticed that people tend to join uh, just a few minutes after 17.30. So if, if starting at 17.45 would be more convenient, then maybe we can we can attempt to to do that. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so I just wanted to find out if uh, people have, have any, any questions related to what we what we covered last uh, the last time we met. I'm not sure if I know we were just looking at uh, uh, mostly, I guess, use cases of uh, rather data mining in practice. So we looked at some some interesting things, uh, uh, curiosity driven research. So things that uh, our friends, our quote unquote friends, are obsessing a lot with. I always like to think of what people elsewhere are doing, especially in the West, as uh, uh, being them working on the is it on the fringes of of science, right? Making an actual, I guess, your classic your classic contribution to science or something. Most of what what we tend to do in this part of the world, for instance, uh, is usually a focus on uh, application, right? So I, I like to refer to it as a uh, Oh, it's not. I'm not the only one, but I, I think what we do is a classic classic example of uh, applied machine learning, really. So it's already the case that we have uh, students, for instance, in the department uh, at UNSA, uh, let's say, uh, focus their attention when they are working on their dissertation. Focus their attention on trying to uh, propose some some novel algorithm or something, right? That's going to be much more efficient and much more effective. Usually what we do is we reuse what is already existing um, and then just apply it to some problem. Now, I, I, I don't know if that's, uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, especially at master's level, but maybe when, when somebody is, uh, is working on, let's say a PhD or something, it becomes a bit of, a bit of a question of the issue here. The question would be what exactly are you what are you bringing onto the table? What is new in what you're doing, right? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if people have any thoughts. I don't know if you've, uh, any comments or, I don't know if you had a chance to digest the things we discussed last time. No, yes. Okay. Um, so something else I wanted to, to mention is that, uh, let me just share my screen actually. Just me a second here. I was trying to export this thing. Maybe as I'm exporting here, I, I know some of you are in. Uh, hopefully, you work in um, in environments where you perhaps I don't know. Maybe you play the pivotal role in the so-called uh, is it the cyber cyber law? It's now law, right? I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that. I was sitting there and I'm thinking, there's so much we can do uh, by way of applying some of the things we're going to be discussing here. Uh, I wonder if we can think of uh, maybe as part of mini projects, think of things we can work on that are somewhat aligned with uh, aligned with some of the things that I mentioned in that bill. Um, <laughs> I thought it was funny that at some point they mentioned computer software and I, I teach uh, a first year course related to that and I'm thinking, no, but it's application software, not, uh, not system software anyway. Uh, so I am sharing my screen, just exported this thing, and then we can start then. So 
I mentioned last time that uh, we we are going to do a bit of uh, uh, it's 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 supposed to be a hands-on kind of session, and I'm, I'm not I'm still not sure exactly how this will pan out, uh, but but uh, hopefully it works. Uh, so what I, what I'm going to suggest we do is, is when we get to a stage where we need to have a safe, safe point of sorts, I will suggest that maybe we pause and then have people work on just, uh, we can make up some exercises to make sure that uh, your configuration is working right. Because the goal, one of the main goals of what we're doing today is to make sure that we we set up our computers or our environments in such a way that uh, we'll be able to, uh, so either um, re-execute the, the Jupyter notebooks that are going to be shared with us or either using Google Colab or maybe using your local machine, you should be able to, to do that without, without any problems. So that's, that's one of the things, one of the main objectives of this is to make sure that you get used to the tools we're going to be using. At least the tools that I'm going to be using as, as part of the examples, um, this, this, this source code examples. Um, but before we start, uh, I had mentioned that we were meant to have uh, uh, a trial paper reading discussion. Um, I, I realized that uh, when I when I shared that thing, I realized that I didn't, I did not, I did not share the rubric that that is used when grading the paper summaries. Remember, the trial paper reading was there to give us an idea of what to expect for that uh, assessment component where we are required to. Uh, read a peer-reviewed publication and then we provide a summary, usually half a page summary. Um, so what I'm suggesting is we move, we move the trial reading discussion to next week. Um, uh, I've shared, the, I'll share the rubric just now, I'll talk about the rubric just now, and then we can have a more productive conversation then. But still, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to have a brief chat about, about the paper itself in case people have any specific questions. Um, also, uh, because the, the trial talk that I had planned to give is tied to the paper itself, I'm thinking um, maybe we can move it, maybe we should move it to next week as well. Um, something else I wanted to mention is that the list of uh, speakers, potential speakers for, for this year um, is, is not yet uh, available, but I will share these details as soon as, 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 soon as we have people start confirming um, the participation. And usually we, we tend to use something like what you're seeing on the right here. Uh, so a detailed schedule of sorts. Um, so in terms of the paper reading summaries, uh, the things that you probably want to pay particular attention to is the, usually the assessment will have this breakdown here, the top part. Um, so there are marks that are ascribed to the coverage. So whether the paper summary that you've prepared is comprehensive enough to touch on all the different data mining aspects of the paper or the different aspects of the paper. Um, so the usual, right? Uh, the novel contribution, uh, things to do with experimentation, uh, the, the key outcomes, so the key results, uh, the key findings of the paper itself. Um, and usually we tend to include marks associated with things like um, personal reflection. So if you are able to relate to what was done, for instance, to our context, Right, so the, the idea is um, the idea is for to force us not just to come up with a data dump, which is just a summary of the paper, but something that's uh, somewhat informative. Right, it shows that uh, there was a bit of uh, critical thinking that went into into the summary itself. And then there are also marks that are allocated to uh, the arguments that you are presenting. It turns out that these these so-called peer-reviewed papers uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that just just because somebody was published or managed to publish in a prestigious um, pre prestigious publication venue, then it means that uh, that the paper is perfect, right? Uh, perhaps you you identify uh, better ways of accomplishing something that they did. Could be methodological, for instance. It could be by way of uh, how, let's say, data was collected uh, and the approach that they took, maybe even the solution. Right, so this is where the arguments part comes in. Um, and then obviously, I mean, things to do with presentation and layout. And again, the, the idea, the, the obsession with things like presentation and layout is to get us used to 
a time when we'll start uh, preparing documents like the proposal document and the final dissertation. Um, but the details to do with this will be provided in the assignment. Maybe I can just give you an example of, uh, of uh, I hope you can hear me, you can still hear me by the way, and uh, you can see my screen, I don't know. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Oh. I'm just trying to see if I can find a uh, paper here, one of the paper reading sessions. I guess I'll look at number two or something. So ideally the, the description of the assessment is something similar to this, right? Uh, so it points you to the actual paper reading summary, right, with a link like so. Um, um, and, and then there's, there's a description of what is expected in the paper and instructions on how you're supposed to submit this. So I guess the most important part that you want to think about, as, as in fact, as you are doing this trial paper reading, if you've done it already and you did take into account these things here, I'd like to suggest that maybe you do that. It would be nice actually if maybe you could also prepare an actual summary, right? That maybe you could share and then maybe next week we can, we can actually go through the summaries or I can comment on the summaries and send them to you personally so that you have a bit of feedback. Feedback prior to us uh, doing the actual assessment. So this is a breakdown of the marks. It's supposed to add up to 100. Um, uh, so yeah, essentially. And this is the part that is to do with the, is it the presentation and layout, this instruction here. Simple stuff, I know, but uh, it turns out that these are things that uh, uh, the University of Zambia, for instance, who obsess about DRGS specifically. So if you, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to, to go to the DRGS website or you familiarize yourself with the DRGS website, but what you notice is that there's a handbook, right? I don't know if I mentioned this, but in this handbook, very useful reference, by the way, in this handbook, you will find specifics of, uh, of things like margins, right? So page margins. Um, this is, I don't know if you can find this here. Probably not, I thought I would find it. Well, I guess it's things like F4 and this is actual, well, so things like uh, the, the font face that you're supposed to use and the size of the font. Uh, they pay particular attention to these things. In part because you can, you can approximate how, I'm just going to share the link in case people, DRGS, uh, website, in case people are not already, oh sorry, that's the DRGS uh, postgraduate guidelines, DRGS website. Um, it, it turns out that it's, it's one way of, uh, of approximating certain things, right? Like for instance, one of, you will notice that if you're writing a dissertation, master's dissertation, the limit is 4,000 words, I think, it is, I think, it should be 4,000 words. And uh, I don't know if there's a comma here. Uh, pages. It's it's supposed to be um, four thousand words, I believe. Uh, and and so one way of doing this is you approximate. Uh, I don't know page limit. Anyway, um, you can check for it, and you'll probably find the information you need in there somewhere. But but uh, so we 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 include all these these things here to get us get us into the habit of getting used to this. It's also nice practice for when you start uh, preparing things like uh, uh, or looking for literature that's going to be associated with the problem you focus on next year. You know, by the way, that process starts early on, I th think as part of research methods, so you start working towards it, towards the project uh, in the second half of this year. All right, um, so I don't know if there are any questions so far. People, do people have any thoughts about the paper that was meant to be a trial reading for or this week, the one we move next week. Maybe you needed clarification or uh, nothing. Okay. okay. Um, Doc, I raised my hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't see that. Please. Derek here. Mm, sorry, I lost you a bit when you were just starting. I just found you in the midst when you are circling that paper. Is there a paper we're supposed to read this week? 
Oh, so the paper we are meant to read is, uh, now this is, uh, I guess it's, it's my way of trying to, uh, <laughs> my way of trying to, to make you read the things that I write about, right? What better way to have more people read your work? Um, so the, 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 the paper for this week was supposed to be a trial. There's no assignment yet, but the idea is uh, for us to make sure that if we read this, remember I shared this and said uh, we're meant to read this, right? This automatic classification of digital objects. I don't know if you saw this. Did anybody see the announcement about the trial paper? Or did you not see the, the announcement? I think I sent an announcement. Mm, not. Yes, you sent it. Not, not from my side, maybe other people. Okay, uh, maybe it's, uh, so uh, it's, So we sent it maybe via- I must have missed out other emails that I have. Yeah, so I sent it on the 23rd, uh, what was this? It was Tuesday, I guess, following the action. So I think on the 23rd, which is this, it's a good thing you, it's, it's okay if you didn't read it because you're pushing it next week. So I, I sent out uh, an email six days ago, uh, so saying that we should uh, go through this paper. Uh, and the idea is we want to, I guess, familiarize ourselves with the process of how we are going to be summarizing the papers, how the summaries will be graded. And this is where this slide here comes in, where I was saying, uh, this is an example of how uh, a paper by somebody from last, uh, last year was graded, right? So you notice uh, there's a breakdown of how uh, how the marks were distributed, right? Based on this rubric here, you notice that uh, accuracy is 25%, coverage is 25%, arguments is 20%, presentation and layout 20%, and then personal reflection is also 10%. <clears throat> um, so, so what I'm suggesting is that uh, if you haven't read this, please find time, just go through it now. It's a journal article, so it's a, uh, and usually, normally what we do is uh, we, we tend to focus on conference papers. And by the way, it's, it's, it's um, in computing, unlike other disciplines, uh, conference papers are actually valued, to a certain extent, they are valued more than journal articles, right? So especially when it comes to recency of information, you typically have the conference being held every year, but a, a journal article have, uh, an insane turnaround time. So to give you an example of the same paper I'm talking about here, you'll notice that, uh, uh, I hope, I thought this thing had, uh, I was trying to see if, uh, I was trying to see if it has those details uh, to do with, okay. Uh, usually the, why, why is this thing? I'm trying to see if I can find, uh, just see if I can find the information to do with how the turnaround time is like. So this paper was submitted uh, in 20, 2019, I believe, but it was only published in 2021, right? Uh, there we go. So if you notice, right, uh, this thing was submitted, was submitted in, on 17th November, 2019. It was accepted in October, right? Almost a year later, right? Uh, October 5th, 2020, and only published published on January 26th, 2021. This is a, it's a long turnaround time, right? If you look at this. Uh, but if you look at conference proceedings, for instance, uh, it's the turnaround time is just, um, it's actually just uh, a few months. After you submit, maybe, two, three months at most, you should get feedback back. Uh, so the other thing is, uh, I was trying to point out is that these, these journal articles are usually quite lengthy, right? So if you look at, uh, if we look at the same paper here that we are reading, if I can just, uh, If you look at this paper, it's uh, 17 pages, right? Quite long here. Now, your average conference paper will not be 17 pages in length, right? A conference, a classic conference paper will probably be less than 10 pages. Sometimes it's actually 
eight, depending on the venue anyway. Uh, so if we look at, uh, I can find that, you know, probably won't, but let me just, if, if we look at uh, a sample we, we looked at maybe le last year, for instance, what you will notice is that, uh, sorry, I'm taking a bit of time. If we look at an example of, uh, maybe the satellite imagery one, right? Um, 11 pages, right? It's about 10 pages. So it depends on the venue. Uh, this is 11 pages. And so I, I hope this is clear. If you didn't get a chance to read this, uh, please, uh, please go through it so that we can have, uh, I guess, a more productive discussion next week. Uh, just attempt to prepare half a page summary idea. So again, if I take you back to, to this specification, you notice that we're saying the summary should be no more than 500 words, right? That's about a page or something, single spacing, I suppose, I don't know. Uh, single spacing for a serif font, I think. Um, so you shouldn't exceed one page. Actually, actually, we recommend half a page, right? Half a page. So this was wrong, it should be just half a page. It shouldn't exceed one page anyway. Um, and then you produce something similar to, 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 to what, what I was showcasing. I don't know where I had it here. But uh, something similar to this, actually. I, I don't know if this makes sense, or you need a clarification. I, don't, I, I hope that answers your question, uh, Derek. It does. It does, yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments about, uh, uh, did anyone manage to read the entire 17 pages? <laughs> or did, did anyone manage to completely read the, the entire, entire paper or something? Hello? Yes, hi. Uh, good evening, Doc. Good evening, hi. Okay, uh, for me, I, I I seem not to have received the the email. I don't know. Okay. Was it shared on email or WhatsApp? No, it was sent to the mailing list. Oh, mailing so, list. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, so I, 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 you have received an that. email from, yeah, CSC 741 at Uzzah the If you're not yet part of the mailing list, if you're not receiving emails uh, from the mailing list, can I quick, can I suggest that, uh, uh, if if you're not receiving emails, please email me, and then we will add you to to the to the mailing list. Turns out that most things are going to be added by the mailing list. It's easier that way. All right. Uh, yeah. So, Doc, I think it's it's a case where I'm also didn't receive because maybe I was not added to the mailing list. I'm just trying to look around if I'm on that mailing list. Okay. So that being the case, how do we access that mail that you sent? Oh, okay. Uh, it, it, at your own time, or maybe now, maybe maybe I hope I hope mails didn't go to your spam folder, right? In which case, maybe the model that's used to detect spam is a bit faulty here. I, I hope that message didn't go to your spam folder. Are you able to quickly check emails from CSC 5741? Is there anyone in here who received uh, that email? Or is, did this affect everybody else? The email was sent through on uh, Tuesday, around at 0545, Tuesday last week. Hello? Yes. Okay, so I have, I have a bunch of emails in my spam folder which came from you. I think, they should, yeah, one of them should be uh, okay, let me just uh, uh, white. I don't know if it's white list. Okay. List, think, yeah, I think they were going to. to Thanks. Um, so the title of email is there anyone who received the email, by the way, or oh, no, none of you did. Subject to the email. Hey, I did receive the the email. Or oh, you didn't receive Hello? it as well. Yes, I, I I did receive I did receive I received the email. Okay, all right, perfect. Thanks. Uh, any thoughts about the paper? Or not? Did you read the entire thing? Or 
<laughs> uh, no, 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 I didn't. Okay, yeah. just attempt mm -hmm. to go through it. Let's try and see if you can make sense out of some of the things being talked about. I mean, it's not uncommon to come across some strange publication which is talking about uh, obscure things, right? Very strange things, but that's fine. And part of the reason, by the way, I'm sharing, I, I, I'm making us read that is because there are a number of examples that are coming our way that will be based on that. So my thinking is that by the time we're getting there, you'd have already familiarized yourselves with, with, with some of the things you're going to be looking at. So it'll be like revision, which will make it, uh, in my view, make it uh, somewhat easier for you to, to understand what we're going to be covering. Okay. Um, so again, just to remind you that uh, the trial reading discussion is next week. Uh, just make an attempt to see if you can summarize even half a page, right? Um, and then we can, I can, I can comment, I can comment on your summaries, or we can just look at your individual summaries next week. That would be nice. I, I prefer to collectively look at the individual summaries because it turns out that um, what what Roy is going to summarize, right? Roy's view of the paper might be different from Ones, it might be different from Derek, for instance, right? So it's always nice to to look at different perspectives. You'd be amazed just um, how much you can learn from people that way. But if you prefer me to comment on the things individually, that's also fine. Also, I don't mind. And then we are moving the talk, uh, the trial talk, to next week. Unless there are any questions, then I, I suppose we can proceed and uh, just uh, quickly walk through the um, the lecture series for today, which is um, which is loosely tagged as uh, Python for data mining and machine learning. Now. I, I wanted to mention up front here that normally we, we tend to have this as lecture series number three be, because we, in the past, we've started with a discussion of uh, a discussion of the various data mining uh, models that exist and then narrowing down to the crisp DM model. But, but I, think, I, think that, I think that our discussion of, of the data mining models and specifically the crisp DM model is going to be much more productive if we throw in a few examples. And I think the examples will make sense, I think the examples will make sense once you already have a few of uh, how you use, uh, you know, things like Python, for instance, for data preprocessing, right? So, so that the, the examples that I'm going to throw into the slides and, and showcase won't, won't feel as though they're strange, right? Which is why I thought it would be nice for us to start with this. So we're jumping straight into, um, into a, into this lecture series before we get to to the uh, discussion of data mining models. All right, so the the series today uh, is broken up into four parts. Um, so quickly start by looking at uh, what I think is a very useful tool, uh, especially when it comes to reproducible research um, and specifically research that's aligned to programming. In the Jupyter notebooks, uh, and, then, and then we'll look at uh, we'll look at uh, it, it just quickly, maybe just a two, three slides, we'll look at so-called Google Colab, which is nothing more than a cloud-based uh, a cloud-based service that enables you to create and work with notebooks, right? So Jupyter notebooks. Um, and with, with, with the way we're interacting, I think it'll be, it, it'll be nice if you would familiarize yourself with Google Colab. And then we'll jump into just a crash course. I like to call this as a crash course introduction to Python. Um, and again, I just wanted to mention up front here that the things that I tend to mention uh, to focus more on are things that will come up often, right? So specific data structures that will come up in the notebooks that I'll be sharing, for instance. Uh, and in fact, uh, things like modules and packages and, and, and maybe perhaps functions, I don't know, um, that you will also find as you are looking up literature, right? Uh, so it's not like it's going to be a comprehensive overview of Python. Python has, has actually matured. Um, there are people that even is it use Python to write uh, web-based applications, um, which is very strange here. Uh, I don't know if people have heard of a, a package called Plon. It's a CMS purely written in, in Python. So things have changed here. Um, for the purposes of what you're doing when it comes to deployment of machine learning models, there's always this question, how exactly am I going to deploy a model once I, once I, once I, once I implement it? Um, you can take advantage of specific frameworks like uh, Flask, for instance, which will enable you to create uh, 
a web service, so an API. So you create your model, you, if it's an offline model, you save it, um, and then you design some, some Flask-based API, and then you can hook it up to uh, whatever application you want to feed, uh, to, to, to get input or push input to your model or something. Um, and then finally, we'll just look at uh, the core Python libraries that we are going to be using. And then it should be enough. Usually in the past, we've done this in two sessions. I don't know, maybe we can do it in one today. I don't know, maybe two still. I'm not sure. But because they, there tends to be a bit of uh, pausing and practicing, maybe we'll do it in, in two sessions as well. So this week and part of next week, hope. All right. Um, so I, I do hope uh, people, by the way, installed some of the, now again, I sent out another email uh, asking people to install Python 3 and, uh, and uh, to familiarize yourselves with, uh, or to install Jupyter Notebooks and also familiarize yourself with Google Colab. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming you didn't receive this email as well. Besides honest, is there anybody else who received this email? Oh, did I? There we go. I sent it on March 26th, which is, uh, must have been Friday. I was saying uh, three days ago. Are there people that received this? Email? I received Oh, you received this, right? I received, yeah. I, uh, I received as well. I received two, I received okay, two. Perfect. It's, it's fine if you didn't, we, we can we can attempt to install some of these things as we are going along. Um, but uh, it might, it shouldn't take long actually. Maybe if, you, if you're using Windows, for instance, you might do it a bit of, you might want to do a bit of reading up on how to, to install Python on Windows. But, but Windows, as always, as always, is just a point and click, right? Next, 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 next. I don't know, you probably want to read the license agreements with the cybersecurity law here. But anyway, um, right, so Jupyter Notebooks, right? So the, the idea behind uh, so-called Jupyter Notebooks is simple, right? Uh, it's centered around uh, producing reproducible code or writing reproducible code. Uh, so the idea that if, I, if, I, if I'm implementing something, let's say model, I should be able to easily share that with, with other people, right? Uh, and I know there's, there's, there's conventional and traditional ways of doing this, like you can, uh, you can share code using platforms like, uh, or vision control systems like Git, for instance, like GitHub or Bitbucket, but, but it turns out that uh, you will soon see, if you're not familiar with this, that it's actually a lot easier for you to, to share code using, um, using Jupyter Notebooks, right? Um, there's a dedicated web uh, website or uh, Jupyter Notebooks, so go to jupyter.org and you should be able to find instructions with how, with regards to how you install the, um, install the piece of software, specific to your platform, of course. <clears throat> uh, in my case, uh, once I have Python installed, installing Jupyter Notebook is as simple as, uh, I hope there's, you know, so pip install, I think it's Jupyter, Jupyter. Is it Jupyter? Pip install Jupyter, I think. Upgrade. I don't know. Is it? Yeah. So it's it's as simple as uh, pip install, uh, Jupyter upgrade. Now, now if you if you go to their website, there's uh, uh, there's diff there's other easier ways that people install uh, these tools, like using uh, is it uh, an account or something? Is it? I don't know what they call it, but uh, I prefer to do this the the more conventional way. Uh, so if you go to Jupyter notebook. Um, you should be able to find these, these details about how you, you, you go about installing this locally on your machine. And I do, I do, uh, yeah, so you can use Conda like so. I do encourage you to install it locally. I do encourage you to run this locally on your machine rather than relying on Google Cola because you might have trouble uh, or you have nowhere to go if you are in a, in a place where you don't have a dedicated internet connection. It's perhaps uh, one would say it's, it's rare in Zambia these days. <clears throat> All right, so, so in, a notebook essentially is nothing more than, it's, it's a web application, right? In fact, when, when you execute it locally, what, what happens is there's a web application that's found and then you open it up using your 
you open up the, the notebook or the application itself using your web browser, right? By default, I think it runs on, is it port 4,000 or something? Um, so, so it's essentially nothing more than a web application that contains, uh, uh, so it's textual content and live code, right? Including things like equations and visualizations, depending on what you're using the, the, uh, the notebook for. Uh, so the textual content would provide descriptive information about what you're doing. Um, so this would be similar to comments, so that if you refer to the notebook at a later stage, you, you, you're able to easily recollect why you did something. And more importantly, if you are sharing this with somebody else, a third party, um, they'll be able to make sense out of your notebook, right? Uh, so the diagram just shows you an example here of a notebook that is, I think it's running locally here, yeah? Um, so just to mention that uh, while, while the, the kernel that we're going to extensively make use of is a Python kernel here, you can see Python 3 on top here. It turns out that you can, you can actually uh, use it for other languages as well. Uh, but for the purposes of CSC 5741, um, it's mostly going, to, not most, it's going to be the Python kernel. So most, we will be running Python code, a little bit of bash scripting, like in my case, uh, when accessing files locally, for instance, uh, you will find batch scripting quite useful when you're using Google Colab and you want to make reference to, let's say, uh, data sets that are stored on Google Drive, for instance. Right? It turns out that you can mount, um, you can mount Google Drive and be able to, 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 um, to analyze or perform very superficial uh, EDS or an exploratory data analysis of the files before you actually start writing code. It turns out it's quite useful, actually. Um, Right. So as, as Elia mentioned, I mean, so the way that you uh, go about installing is just go to jupyter.org and then slash install. You should be able to find uh, details of how exactly you go about installing uh, the notebook. Maybe maybe as we are playing along here, if you haven't yet installed the Jupyter notebook on your local machine, I wanted to ask that maybe you can, you can try and see if you can set it up as we are as we're interacting, right? So you go here and then choose an option, either use PIP um, or you can use uh, you can use Conda or something. There's an installation guide, it turns out here. But if you already have Python installed, if you, you installed Python, all you have to do is just uh, open, uh, I'm not sure if you can run this, I think you should be able to run this on, on the command line, CMD, and then just type in Keep install Jupyter Lab, and then you should be able to uh, install Jupyter Notebook. If not, um, if you go to the ins installation guide here, I'm sure there are details on how to set up a, a Conda either on Windows or whatever distro you're using, I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, all right, so this is this is what you, you tend to see here. Uh, and. Just feel free to pause me if if you tell me to stop if if you think uh, there's something that you need you need clarity on so that we're on the same page here. Very simple end user interface, similar to your normal web application, right? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to attempt to see if I can switch to I can actually switch Doc, to. May, may I disrupt you? Yes, please. Doc, may I disrupt you? Okay, Please go when ahead. You go to the Jupyter website. There, who, <clears throat> when I'm on the Jupyter website, there yes. is install notebook and install Jupyter lab. Which one do we go for? Where, which which page are you on? Jupyter.org. Okay. I just clicked on the link you shared on mail. Oh, okay. Uh, I uh, go go for install. No, oh, so here's the thing. Uh, so I, I think uh, it's, Jupyter Lab should be should be a successor of Jupyter Notebook. I uh, please install the notebook. It's the notebook. Yeah, install the okay. notebook. Okay, noted. Yeah. So you know that Python is it a prerequisite that I should have Python installed before I go to the notebook? Yes, because uh, because 
one of the one of the ways in which we use uh, Jupyter Notebook is to write Python code. So I would suggest you install Python first, and then you install Jupyter Notebook. Okay, all right, yes. good, thanks. If, if all, of us, all of us can do this, that would be really nice. I, th I think it would be much more productive that way. Uh, in fact, this, this session won't be, it won't be um, boring that way. <clears throat> anyway, so, right, so it turns out this is the sort of interface that you see, right? And just to show you, uh, uh, to, to make sure that we are making reference to something that you can actually see, what I would do is, at the same time as I'm walking us through the, the slide deck, I will switch to um, a more recent notebook that I've been working on, right? So that I point to specifics because some of the screenshots that I have here are truncated, right? So it'd be nice if you could see everything. Um, so I will I will just quickly go through this notebook here. Just uh, open it. Uh, so when I run it, you notice that, like I said, it's a web application, it's running on uh, port, uh, oh, what do you know? 8,888, okay, that's fine. Um, and this is what I see, right? Uh, typically by, by, by convention, the notebooks are, are created, once you create a notebook, it has an IPYNB extension. So an IPython, an interactive Python notebook, right? Um, and so you can notice here that uh, the, when I run the command Jupyter notebook, it, it automatically opens up, it spawns the web application, um, and then it lists all the files in the directory where I ran the command from, right? So in this case, I, I, ran, I ran the command in here. So in here I have, uh, if I can just showcase to you. It's in here. So these are the files that I have here listed, right? These are the files that I'm seeing here. Um, but every time I create a new notebook in my project folder, this would ideally be a project folder. Uh, the IPython notebook is created by default. You just give it a name and then by default, it's given this extension, IPYNB, right? Interactive Python notebook. If I open this up, um, I'll be able to see the, the, um, the visuals that are in the slide deck, right? So your, your, uh, your menu items there um, and, and, and your toolbar, I guess. It's, it's taking quite a bit of time here because this is, a, this is an unusually large notebook, right? And the idea again is uh, reproducibility, right? It turns out that uh, a useful thing when it comes to data mining, one, one useful thing about, <clears throat> about a reproducible workflow like this is you have your entire end-to-end -end data mining process as part of the notebook. So if I start scrolling down here, and I hope this thing is properly labeled, but what you notice is uh, this notebook is set up in such a way that there's a, a data collection as part of the pipeline. This is the entire machine learning pipeline. There's a data collection process, a data preparation, data transformation, there's a model implementation, there's evaluation, right? Where we, we, we are evaluating different um, different estimators that we're using and different techniques. Um, and then there's also a, a bit of uh, exploratory data analysis where we have visual representation of, is it the results? So when we are, we are just trying to analyze the data before we actually pre-process it. It turns out that's all useful stuff to do. Um, this is actually the beauty of a notebook like this, right? So I've implemented, this thing has a complete implementation of the, of the data mining, um, a data mining pipeline and incidentally, what this uh, particular notebook does really, it, it, it implements uh, a multi-label classifier, right? For classifying, um, for classifying SEM subject headings, right? Um, but anyway, that's fine. Um, so there's a data collection, data preparation, data transformation. There's a bit of um, exploratory data analysis, superficial. We also have graphs in here. Right, we, we, I hope, I hope this thing, uh, and I don't want to start running this because uh, this is a bad example, I guess. I was hoping the, the graphs would be here, but why? I was hoping the graphs would be here just to showcase some of these uh, 
you know the errors here, we're running out of memory at some stage. I so wish we had graphs somewhere. Okay, that's fine. Um, but anyway, it's it's an end-to-end -end pipeline, right? It has everything. Um, and, and the way that you can tell that it's a complete pipeline here is if you see these import statements, we discussed these import statements during our discussion of uh, crash course introduction to Python, but, but this is a range of libraries, right? That we're using as part of the pipeline. Some of them are to do with graphing, like matplotlib here, right? Some of them are to do with uh, data analysis, like NumPy and Pandas. Um, some of them are to do with uh, text preprocessing, like this regular expression, this RE uh, uh, package, right? It's uh, the regular expression package. Some of them are specific to uh, graphing, like Seaborn. Uh, Tixiplotlib is there just to ensure that there's font consistency when you, um, uh, when you're preparing, um, it, when you're, when we're, because we're preparing our publication using LaTeX, right? So the idea is to produce uh, graphs that are going to seamlessly be integrated with the publication itself, right? Um, SKLearn is uh, the machine learning library that we are going to, or package that we're going to use extensively, right? Um, so you can see it here, right? Uh, NLTK, it's a natural language processing toolkit, right? So, so you, can, you can tell here by just the sheer number of, of libraries that we're using that, that this is a complete, it has to be a complete uh, 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 data mining pipeline that has all the phases, including evaluation, right? The only part that's missing here, I think, is deployment because we only go so far as to, to, to save our offline model, right? Uh, in, terms, in terms of font consistency, just in case people are wondering, um, what I'm showcasing here is feeding into, into a, a paper that we are, we, are, we, are, we are attempting to submit somewhere. But in terms of con font consistency, what I mean is uh, these graphs here, right? So a graph like this with, with the package tickz, right? The tickz, the tickz lead package here, this thing. Just, I shouldn't be explaining this, but in case people are wondering. I was talking about TXZ plot lib. What this does is it makes sure that the, or it ensures that the fonts in the graph itself um, match these fonts that are in the graph, they match the font that is being used in the, in the paper itself, right? Using LaTeX anyway, we're, we are typesetting this in LaTeX, but that's fine. Um, all right, so you have a combination of text and live code, right? And you specify these in, in cells, right? So the cells would be uh, the things that are numbered here. Um, so the first cell here has, uh, has this code here, which is just there to provide descriptive information um, to the output PDF that, that would be generated because you can export this um, to PDF, by the way, if you wish, or you can share the notebook. We found that sharing the PDF helps uh, with CSC 5741, I don't know. Um, so the cells are numbered. You can, you, can configure, you can configure your notebook so that your cells are numbered. Uh, we can toggle it off if you don't feel like numbering the cells. We prefer to number them because it makes it a lot easier to point to a specific thing we're discussing. Right, so you have a combination in these cells, you have a combination of both textual content and actual live code, right? Um, and, and you typically would use uh, the shortcut keys, but also the menu item and the toolbar for you to execute a particular cell, right? So in the case of this notebook, for instance, you'll notice here that, uh, I'm just going to reset this kernel, right? Uh, and I'll clear the output because when you execute a kernel, or so when, when you start executing these cells, what happens is they're numbered, right? So one means it's, it was executed anyway. So if I clear this cell, if I say restart and clear output, right? <clears throat> there, there won't be a number here. Once I start executing this, the first and second won't have numbers by the way because of the nature of the content. But when I execute these import statements here, I will have a, a number appear. Initially you notice that there's an asterisk that appears. It's a signal that uh, that the, the, the execution process has not yet finished, right? So once you have a number associated to the cell, then 
uh, you'd have su su successfully executed that code, right? Again, text your content, uh, it doesn't have corresponding numbers. This is all markdown. We talk about markdown just now. Um, but the moment I start executing these utility functions, again, observe, I'm executing, and I'm using a shortcut key, shift enter here, but I could easily press run here. Once I press run, because this is not, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not code that takes a long time to run here. It's nothing more than a function here, right? Um, it, it's a simple function here. Uh, it was quick, you, you didn't notice that there's an asterisk there. Uh, and something else that happens is that when you execute a cell, the context immediately switches to the next cell. I don't know if you noticed this. The, the current active cell has this blue vertical bar here. You can tell, even, there's even a rectangle, a bounding box here that shows you that this is active. The moment I run it, it will move to the next one, yeah? Um, and then there'll be a number here. Uh, unfortunately, all of these things I'm executing for now don't have corresponding output because these are all functions. But if we get to a stage where there is output expected, like for instance, we are coming here to these, uh, these cells, you just have to data inspection here, you'll notice that there'll be out output immediately after this cell, you observe. I run this, I run next, uh, sorry, this is commented out, but there'll be an output in the current cell. Once I run this, there's output that comes up here, right? Um, so what we're trying to say here is once you execute a cell, there's optionally going to be output that appears immediately below the input cell, right? So that would be the cell that has the code, the live code that you've executed. And again, the live code is dependent on the type of kernel you're using um, if, you, if you look at this here, it's, it's a Python kernel here, right? But we have a combination of both Python and a bit of Bash here. This is not Python, this is Bash, right? Or shell scripting, if you've shell, shell scripted in the past, that's fine. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know if this is making sense here. Am, am I still audible enough or? C can you still hear me? Yeah, you I can. Okay. Um, do you think um, I'm trying to see if this, uh, I was trying to see if maybe we can wait until the, maybe we can wait until the end once I'm done with this part and then try and see if people can play around with it, because this needs to wait, right? Again, I just wanted to emphasize that, you see, if, if we are working towards a certain, if we're working towards something, and the examples, all examples are going to be shared uh, using a notebook like this. Now, I can share this, and running this is easy, right? In fact, you can, you can run everything at once if you want to. You can restart and run all, right? And then you'll be able to see the output, but what you need to do is you need to be able to to understand what's going on. So, which is why I want us all to get to a stage where at least we can use, we can use a notebook, right? We can, we can, we can, we can create our own notebook, for instance. Um, so maybe we'll have a short exercise in the next few minutes to try and see if people can just, uh, if people can just, uh, just experiment with creating a very simple notebook, right? We'll do something very basic, something simple. Okay, that's fine. Um, pause. All right, so you have both live code and, and output appears below. Now, I'm not sure if people are familiar with uh, Markdown. I mean, it's, uh, so one of the reasons I, we talk about this is, it's, it's not very important really, but when, when you're preparing notebooks, it might become important because, uh, um, yeah, it is important, I suppose, I don't know. It, 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 it enables you to produce uh, a visually appealing notebook, right? And in fact, Markdown makes it possible for you to be able to produce very nice, um, observe, very nice, uh, 
very nice uh, output in PDF. So if, if you don't want to produce, if you don't want to share your notebooks, right, uh, as, as a Jupyter notebook, let's say you're you sharing this with somebody who, who doesn't have a Jupyter notebook installed, right? Um, and you want to, let's say, uh, share what you've done to them. Well, we can export the notebook as PDF, similar to something like this, right? If you notice, this, this was a notebook exported to PDF. Now, the, the beauty with, one of the advantages of Markdown is that you produce a well-structured output afterwards. Both, both within Jupyter Notebook itself or Google Colab, and also when you export that notebook as a PDF or as HTML, for instance. So it, it'll be like any other normal document that's prepared using Microsoft Word, for instance, where you can see that this is a, I guess this is a level two heading, right? Level two heading, and then you have level three headings and whatnot, level two, level three, right? Possibly just a, a board text here or something, right? You even have hyperlinks, right? Um, it may be useful if, in fact, um, sometimes consuming, consuming a, a notebook using PDF might be uh, advantageous than, or desirable than, than consuming it uh, using Google Colab or a notebook itself because this would have already been executed, so you have access to both the, the cell, the cell with the live code, right? And the output as well also, which is right below here, right? In all these different instances, but that's bash there up there, but uh, it's a classic the Python here. So live code and the output right below here. Oops. Right, so, so, so the way that, remember we mentioned that you have texture content and live code, right? Which live side by side um, in this same ecosystem. Well, so you, you mostly uh, write, not most, you write texture content using uh, a markup language called Markdown. It's, it's um, I don't know if people are familiar with Markdown. Is, uh, maybe the developers in the house should be because GitHub, um, if you work with GitHub or Bitbucket, the about or the readme file is Markdown, right? Uh, if you're one of those people who edits uh, Wikipedia, for instance, uh, let's see if the rest of Zambia has changed. You, you edit, if you're a Wikipedian, you notice that you edit, you edit Wikipedia using Markdown, right? So this thing, I don't want it. This thing here is written, this is all Markdown here, right? This is all Markdown. This is all Markdown. Uh, are, are people familiar with Markdown or no? Is there anyone who is familiar with Markdown? Is, is, is there anyone who is not familiar with Markdown? <laughs> but maybe not. I guess I'm the only person who edits uh, with Wikipedia or something. But anyway, it turns out that this is, you, you create Markdown. Uh, Markdown is just like HTML, by the way. Um, so so instead, of, instead of this, you'll soon see that, uh, I don't know why people always invent things that are, but I know it's implicit, right? In HTML, right, you have something like uh, like this, right? Uh, in Markdown, you'd have uh, you have this, right, or this. I prefer the, the I prefer this syntax myself. I use a lot of pounds, but you can also use the equal sign. You notice that in Wikipedia, they're using this, right? History of Zambia. You see, if I change. Uh, it should be able to work if I change this to, because it's level two here. So under history, it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't, it shouldn't really make a difference, right? Whether I'm using uh, two pound, two pound signs or, oh, this thing is, I guess it's a specific uh, syntax of markdown, I guess, I don't know. That's sad, but, uh, 
But as an example, what I will do is I will do this. I will, because I have a plugin, a Chrome plugin, right? Uh, so I will write heading one using HTML. Okay, heading two, I'll say this is a markdown example or something. And then I'll save this as a home, and then I'll save this as CSV 741. Markdown that MD. We shouldn't be doing this, but I just wanted I want to showcase something here, right? Uh, so if I if I go to CSC 741 markdown, which is right here, and I open this come on plugin, and I know this is not working here because that plugin is not installed as part of my Unza, I'm using my Unza uh, account here, so I'll switch to the Chrome instance that has my personal account. This is what I meant, right? Um, so you have, I wonder if this is supposed to be, this is weird, right? Hmm. I wonder why, Markdown, am I forgetting the Markdown syntax, Markdown? Syntax. I'm wondering why my, my thing doesn't... Uh... Has to be an eco sign or something somewhere. Anyway, maybe I... Was I dreaming or something? What? It has to be marked down for... This is weird, but um, I'm trying to find a resource that will explain that, there we go. Maybe this will talk, t tell us a bit about what, what we're trying to talk about here. But I, I mostly use, uh, yeah, cosine is a DALI. This is, uh, this is the authoritative source we need here. Okay, uh, let's see if we can find this. Right, so this is the part. I'm surprised that that plugin I'm using is not working. Wikipedia also is misbehaving. So Markdown offers two styles for headings, right? Uh, CTX and uh, ATX, right? Uh, ta -da -ta -ta. There we go. So you can you can use uh, eco signs and hyphens. I'm not sure. Ah, so I, I know why. So when you're using the eco signs, you have to close it like so. This should work hopefully now with. Uh, with this. No, still not working. I don't know why. Anyway, that's fine. I don't know why. But anyways, um, I'm wondering, I'm still curious why this is not working. Maybe it's because my, hmm. I'm, I'm curious here why this is not working, by the way. I'm sorry that we're pausing here. I know there are developers in the room, maybe they, they know what's happening here. I'm just going to quickly go to one of my repositories, right, and just check to see if uh, the different styles will function, right? Uh, so if I go to simplest one, I guess, I don't know. And I, I edit this. Let's see if this will work. Heading one. I don't want to commit this, I just want to preview. It's still not working. I'm not sure why this is this is misbehaving here. Uh, I don't know why. I have to look at it later on or something. I'm not sure why this is not, not working here. It's supposed to, like so, I don't know. Anyway, uh, we'll go with the syntax that works. We can look at this later on. I don't know why this is not working. Even GitHub, which is a bit strange here. That's fine. 
you can look at it later on anyway. All right, so, but, but in essence, um, so Markdown, right? We're using the syntax which is in the slide which we know works for now. Uh, we can look at uh, the other syntax, try and figure out why it's not working. It, it appears to work in Wikipedia. And in fact, this, this syntax doesn't appear to work in Wikipedia also. It's very strange. Right, but, uh, so Markdown is everywhere these days, right? I'm sure you, those things you, 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 you post in, in, in WhatsApp where you, you use the underscores and the asterisks to make the text bold and, 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 and to emphasize the text to make it in italics. It turns out that that's Markdown, right? So in WhatsApp, for instance, you, WhatsApp accepts certain uh, WhatsApp Markdown. Um, what you're doing here is uh, you can format your messages using, uh, using Markdown, right? And I think everybody does this these days, right? So, so these, these are the things that you find like this, this is all Markdown, right? This is all Markdown. Uh, so the same, the same effect I would have here if I, if I said uh, I wish to make this text bold. Or is this italic or something? I don't know, bold or italic. Um, and I, I open up, uh, I use my, my thing here. You notice that it either be italic or bold. It's italic, I think. Italic. Bold appears to be underbar. Or is it too, is it too, I'm forgetting things here. I don't know if it's two asterisks or something. Yeah, so it's two asterisks, right? And um, you make it both. So it's all Markdown, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, Markdown is not that hard to, to pick up or to learn. In fact, the only things you're probably going to find use for uh, uh, how to enumerate things, right? Um, so either using bullets or uh, uh, how to list things, either using bullets or to perform an enumeration, right? One, two, three, for instance. Um, how to create some sort of structure, level one, level two headings. Um, how to include links there, right? Sometimes you might want to create a link to a data set, for instance. And what you're doing is similar to what, what you'd be doing when you're writing in a markup like HTML. So you're you are working with content by specifying structure, right? Similar to XML, for instance, one of the same. Um, so some some common some common some common uh, markdown markdown um, uh, markup you're going to work with um, will be headings, obviously, right? So if you're using this syntax here, level one heading is just one pound, level two is two pounds, um, or, or two hashes, level three is three hashes, level four is four hashes. Um, and then the way that you you create a list of sorts um, is you just use an asterisk. So in the code itself, if you have a list of things that you, things that you want to list as bullet points, um, all you do is you, you, you go to your source, which is just plain text. Uh, this is a list example or something. This is an example of the list. And then you list them like so. And, and you notice because I'm using an editor here, Kate, which, um, which is able to automatically de detect uh, uh, the contents of the file depending on what extension I'm using. It, it says that it's MD, it color codes things here, right? So uh, list item one, list item two here, right? And if I come here and I view this, I will have bullet points like so. Um, right, uh, so, so you find yourself doing things like this, for instance. Um, and then if you want to, uh, to have an ordered list, right? So this, this would be an, an ordered list with bullet points, uh, an enumeration which is ordered you just use numbers instead of asterisks, right? So one, two, three. Uh, so you say, this is an example of an enumeration or something. And then you say, uh, number one, uh, number two or something. Uh, when you go to view this, it will have an enumeration for you, right? Properly indented, obviously, uh, like who, like you would even if you had HTML. Now the, the other interesting thing, right, is uh, depending on which platform you're using, in fact, with notebooks, you can actually embed HTML also, I believe, I think. You can embed HTML somehow. I hope this works here. 
so I can say uh, the University of Zambia, for instance, right? And then come here and just say uh, HTTPS uh, for ZM or something. And then so hopefully you should be able to work here. Yeah, there you go. So you can also embed, uh, you can embed uh, HTML within, right? This also works in, 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 in the Jupyter Notebook, by the way, including Google Caller. It becomes tremendously useful because there are certain things that you'd find difficult to do in Markdown. So you can use your HTML knowledge and be able to do this also. And again, right, in, in case you're wondering why we're doing this, just to mention that your, your notebook can get really complex, similar to what I was showcasing here. Where is that notebook? Here. If it's something that's complex as this, you want to make sure that uh, it's hyperlinked somewhere, right? So if you need to refer to an external source, Maybe a paper, for instance. Uh, if you're collaborating with other people and you're working on a certain part of your notebook, you want to be able to provide comprehensive references, right? Um, this is where it becomes tremendously useful for you to, to be able to provide uh, very informative textual content, right? Links to resources, right? Of course, I mean, when you're working with live code, uh, for instance, uh, Python, the way that you, you create comments in Python, right? The way that you work with comments in Python will work in the cell itself. So if you look at cell number four, for instance, here, line number one is a comment, and we discussed this just now. This line number one is a comment, which is why it won't be executed. If I want to include a multi-line comment, do I still, how do I, my goodness, am I, am I forgetting multi-line? Multi-line comments in Python, docs, three lines like so, see three, there we go. So this would work as well, right? So if I execute this code, uh, nothing will work or nothing should be able to work because it's a, it's a doc style comments anyway. I don't want to pollute this by the way. And I shouldn't have done that, but that's okay. Uh, all right, I, I, I don't know if this is making sense so far. Any, any, any thoughts or comments? Is, is there, are we trying this out on the other end to try and see if it's working or something? Okay. Uh, I hope I haven't lost my connection here. Let me just check. Uh, no, where is that? Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe can, can we can we pause here and just uh, is there anyone who's managed to set up uh, a notebook? Uh, is anyone who has a functional notebook so far? Or are you testing this or not yet? Not, not yet from my end. Okay. Uh, I managed to set up one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are, are you able to? I also managed to set up one. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe maybe we can manage to set up. Maybe we can we can have you do uh, just a few things to see if it works. Once we are done discussing the code part, uh, it'd be nice if I could unshare my screen and then somebody else could share their screen. Um, let's try and see if we can do this. All right, um, so, right, in terms of, I mean, the code, I mean, we've already mentioned that the code lives uh, side by side with the textual content. Um, so in our case, uh, code is being referred to as the Python code, obviously, and the shell commands, um, but, but also uh, the uh, so-called uh, magics or tricks that you can use, right? Within here, and they'll come up, uh, will come up as we as we are we are discussing this, right? Um, but but so the way you specify uh, the way you specify the way you specify Python code is just a, the way you'd actually write it uh, in your favorite IDE. Maybe you use a use a, a very fancy plugin within a Visual Studio Code, for instance, or you prefer the terminal, for instance. You do the same thing, right? So I'd come here. 
and uh, if I want to, if I want to just uh, print five plus five, for instance, print ten, I'll do the same thing in notebook in, in Jupyter notebook. And what I would do now is, uh, I think now would be the best time to just. Uh, uh, I don't want to mess up the other notebook, so I will. I will go to this year. And uh, just just go here. Uh, I'll just call this lectures row two or something. So I'll sp I'll spawn uh, a new instance of Jupyter notebook, and then I'll just cancel the other one I had so that we start from scratch. So this is still running. I'll just cancel this, and then I will start running this. All right. So you notice that I have nothing. Um, what I will do is I'll just create a new notebook, Python 3 notebook, and then I'll just name this uh, code user 21, this is 41. I'll call this lecture one, so one or something. <clears throat> All right, so what I was saying is uh, the, the, the raw Python code, you just write in this cell. So if I'm in, if I if I want if I'm wanting to do the same exact thing I was doing here, where I was just printing the result of five plus plus five, I would come here and I would run the same I would write the same command here and I'll have it. I run it, I have the output below. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if we have the discussion of uh, no we don't. Okay, maybe now would be a time to talk about some of these things as well. So, <clears throat> shell commands also, right? Um, you can run shell command besides the Python code. And the way that is you prefix a command with uh, an exclamation mark, right? Um, <clears throat> and they're also what are called uh, uh, cell magics. And you get to see these by, there's a fancy command that you write, ls magic, you, you have a list of all the so-called uh, uh, so magics that you have access to. Uh, some people will probably not use these, but but if you if you intend to explore this field much much further, if you want to do this on a on a production scale, I suppose uh, these are all useful things you might want to you might want to pick up. Um, shell commands very very useful, right? Extremely useful actually. Uh, so if you know how to run. If you know how to run uh, shell commands, I mean, you'll be able to run all the fancy things that you, you run, right? Uh, PWD, uh, LS, um, uh, DF, I don't know what else people do here, right? Then you'll be able to, essentially, right? <clears throat> this, this thing makes you more productive by, by doing the things that you'd otherwise have to do by changing context. So imagine a situation where I'm, um, let's say, processing some data file. And I do this a lot myself, right? Before I, I import a data file into, into Pandas for analysis, right? What I'll do first is I'll probe it, right? I'll, I'll play around with it first using shell commands because I'm more productive that way. So instead of me changing context and coming here and saying, uh, well, uh, let me find uh, the file. Where is the file first? Uh, it's maybe it's going to be in here, I suppose. I don't know if we can find the data source here. I'm just trying to see if I can find uh, a bit of data file, and then uh, let me see if I can find a data file and then push it there. Place it here. Scripts. Hmm. Data sets, maybe. Excellent. So if I, let's say I wanted, uh, let me just, if I wanted to inspect this file, I'd have to run. Yes, I'll pick, pick this file actually. Um, I'll, 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 I'll be doing what I'm doing right now, right? Changing context, going to the terminal, and then um, uh, trying to see if I can if I can make sense out of the out of the out of the data itself. But it turns out that there are easier ways of doing this, right? Right within Jupyter Notebook itself, right? So what I've done is I've just moved uh, I've just moved that file there. Uh, I will restart I will restart this restart and clear output, and then 
come back here and showcase that if I do an LS, I'll be able to see this file, yeah? This file here. So I'll be able to do the things that I was doing when I switched context from right here. So I'll insert a cell below and just say, well, maybe I want to run the more command on, on this file here, dbvar. And it, it, you can do the usual autocomplete, right? Using your tab window, you get the same effect. Then you notice that I have access to this thing here, right? Um, I can I can do the the usual things that you you do if you have a large data set and you're you're working on the terminal using bash for instance, um, or when you're show scripting, I can count the the number of uh, lines I have here. So it's it's not a large file, just 40, 46 entries, right? Um, I don't know. Right. Uh, then I was saying you can run these uh, these uh, magics by just saying it is magic or something, and then you'll be able to have a list of um, these uh, magics that you can use. So if you want to render HTML, for instance, you do that, right? And then you'll be able to render whatever content you have as HTML. Useful sometimes, sometimes, but not all the time, right? Um, I don't know. Um, and then something else you will do, obviously, is uh, you will find yourself uh, visualizing data, right? So, um, um, especially some exploratory data analysis, for instance, and you're working with a, a, a large data, data set, uh, one of the first things you do before you even import it into pandas or something, in fact, you can import it in pandas, but you, you need to analyze it somehow to make sense out of the data you're working with, right? Visualizations are key. Um, and so Jupyter Notebooks provide you with, with that vehicle to do that, right? Uh, quite easy, right? A combination of different packages, of course. Um, so I'm not sure if we can try and showcase an example here. Uh, so I'll just say import pandas as PD or something. And then say uh, uh, var input is equal to pd dot read uh, read uh, csv right it's a csv file that, that we have there this csv file um, the separator is equal to if you notice when I, when we were when we were uh, when we were taking a peek at this file here. You notice that it's pipe pipe separated, yeah? One, two, three fields, which is why when I came here, I was saying uh, separate it with pipe symbol, right? Uh, and this thing here, because it's a file name, is supposed to be in strings or something. Uh, so, because I'm using pandas, I can view it nicely and we discuss pandas very very soon, where we talk about um, we talk about um, how it's related to something we're familiar with, your average spreadsheet application, right? Um, so this would be a familiar site for you. This should be a familiar site to you. Uh, so we can do things like uh, let's see here dot plot. I don't know if I can make this all. I mean, I just, I just showcase something that is strange. You wouldn't want to just, it, it just figured out how, how the data should be represented or something. I was just show, showing, showcasing that you can, um, you, you can actually visualize, right? That's the key thing here. The visuals you, you, you want to render is up to you, right? Whether it's a bar plot, whether it's a pie chart. And we discuss these things um, once we get to a stage where we are, we are looking at specific packages, right? Um, so key thing though is you can visualize things. And this makes sense, right? Because if you remember, what I mentioned is the motivation behind using a tool like this is to produce um, reproducible code, right? And if it's reproducible, then you want to include the entire pipeline as part of this notebook, right? Uh, so the EDA process, the data collection part, the data preparation, the data transformation, 
the, the evaluation, and in fact, evaluation almost always involves you generating graphs, right? Showcasing things like the accuracy and fancy, fancy visuals like your confusion matrix, for instance, um, or your rock caves or something. But, but, but anyway, key thing here is you can include visuals also, right? Um, I don't know if people have any thoughts so far. Do you, could somebody maybe volunteer to show, showcase uh, just your, if your notebook works here? Uh, this, in an ideal case, would be going around as, as a practical in the lab to make sure that everything is set up, but uh, this online thing, I'm not sure if it's working out, maybe we'll find a formula that works here. Is there a vol volunteer, I think honest or member, you probably had a setup. Is there anyone who is able to show us what they have I want to share my screen, and then maybe someone could showcase their setup or something. Any volunteers? No. Okay. So sorry, you just mean the the setup. On yeah, or are you able to, I've been, I've been, I've been, sorry? Are, are you able, are you able to run, have you run Jupyter Notebook? Are you able to run it? I, uh, yes, it's on my local host, uh, but I haven't written anything on it so far. Yeah, open Just, it up, uh, let's, let's see, maybe we can, do you want to open it up and share okay. your screen and show us what you have here? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm trying to, a bit of a method of the madness here. I'm trying to get us to a stage where at least everybody is able to do hopefully what Honest uh, has done so that uh, when, uh, and I'm looking at the time, I'm, I'll probably start sharing these notebooks when we start diving into the introduction to Python or something. Okay, are uh, you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, I am. I don't know about the others. Are the others able to see on his screen? I can see his screen. I can't see his screen. I'm, I'm oh. able to see. Yeah. yeah, I'm able to see the screen. Now. The screen. Oh. You, want, you want to check your, your setup, remember? Yeah, right. so, yeah. so, so here's the thing, right? Uh, so start, first starting point is, so the, the key thing here is make sure that your installation is working, right? Clearly it is working for um, for, Remember here, and I see here, I don't know if you've noticed, sorry, uh, honest, but uh, you, you, you created, you've created a whole bunch of notebooks, right? Four I minutes know. ago? Yes, uh, they're there. at the really. bottom. They are running, two of them are running. It's if you scroll big. down, you have jupyter1.ip, you want to pay particular attention to the IP, yes. So oh, that's yes. one, of, yeah, you also have the untitled one. So every time you click the new, you create a new Python notebook. In fact, okay. your project could have multiple notebooks. What I prefer myself is just to have one notebook, which has the entire pipeline, unless if I'm doing multiple things, right? Okay, um, so, yeah. So, so just when click on one. On one, okay. Yep, yeah. there we go. So boom. Um, so as a starting point, uh, we can, so this is the syntax I was talking about. You want to use the, so remove the equal sign and, and just use the pound or the hash syntax, yep, and then re replace those with two hashes. You notice that it even changes, so if you, if you press enter, it will be able to, if you press, uh, okay, if you click on run, on top there, the toolbar, it will hopefully. No, it's not uh, putting so, anything. So go back to, go back to the cell which has the heading, and remove the, no, the same notebook you had open. Yep, remove the two, uh, the two, this is the, so here's the thing, right? Yep, Here, I, 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 here's the thing. If you look up on top in your toolbar, you see where you have code there, right mm -hmm. before the keyboard? Yes. So when you're writing text, your content, I don't know if I mentioned this, but click on that and then choose, choose that option. Markdown? Yeah. There we go. And then now click in this cell and then click run. Okay. 
right? So, so this is essentially what, what it does, right? Um, and then you can, I don't know if you have, you use Windows or something, I don't know if you use Windows, but... Uh, yeah, this is, win this is Windows. Yeah, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure how Markdown works with Windows, but can you try in the second cell which has been highlighted, can you type the exclamation mark with LS? I don't know if I, I don't use Windows myself. And then press run again. Yeah, so anyway, so it, it, it uses your okay. So if, if you were running this on Linux, obviously this would work, right? But if you mm -hmm. replace the pound sign ls with just the print print command, print hello world or something, the usual, without the exclamation mark, because the exclamation mark is for uh, scripting, right? So without the exclamation mark, and then just print hello world or something. So if you've, if you've installed Python, that should be able to work also. Uh, now this is the thing, I think Python 3 has introduced, you need to put it in parentheses. Uh, well, also in, in obviously in, in quotes, but I think that should work as well, but it's an odd syntax. Now the, the text, the string has to be, now after the print command, the text has to be in parentheses. The, uh, no, so after print space and then up uh, the the uh, round bracket, so the parentheses. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and you need to open and close it also. Okay. And then that text has to be in uh, in quotes. In quotes. Yeah, there's a trick though, right? I think it should be work. So, uh, and do that and type hello without quotes. Just undo that, let's see if it works. Remove everything and then just type hello without quotes, yeah? And then, well, not hell, but hello. But, and, then, <laughs> and then just select the hello, just select it with, and then press, press your double quotes, maybe shift quotes or something, I don't know how you do that. I hope it works on you. But this, this, it, it, it's one of being, yep, there we go. And then you can press enter, and then uh, one of being productive. When you press enter, it should be able to, if you have Python installed, you should press run, you should be able to present the output. Press run. Yeah, so at, at least we, it's, so this is a thing here, right? Uh, I know it looks trivial, but but this is the thing is this is how you create the textual content, right? Um, but also, this is how you uh, you you write uh, code like Python code, for instance. Uh, now I don't know. I've forgotten my my batch, not batch, but my batch scripting from back in the day. I don't know if they work in uh, in 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 Jupyter notebook. Seeing as you're using Windows, you might want to look it up at the at a later stage. Uh, but anyway, key takeaway point is it's, it's not really that um, that hard. If we can all get to this stage, that would be really good. Where we install Python and then we can we can also make use of, uh, uh, we can use Jupyter Notebook. Any, any thoughts before we, maybe before we, uh, we have uh, Honest uh, and share his screen? Have more people managed to set up Python and uh, Jupyter Notebook? Oh, we can do this later, maybe. Okay. Um, <clears throat> maybe the next part should be much, this is the easiest route. So honest, maybe you can unshare your screen and then I can share my screen again. So the, the next part we are looking at is how to, um, how to um, how to use uh, Google Colab, right? And it turns out, right, that uh, so-called Google Colab um, is nothing more than just a, a cloud-based version of your either your I don't know if you can see my screen either your Google your your Jupyter notebook or Jupyter Lab, right? Um, very trivial and easy to use, really. Um, so the way you you use Google Colab is uh, you just go to colab.research.google.com. Um, and then you'll be presented with an easy to use interface, somewhat familiar or similar to, to what you see in, 
jupt notebook or jupt lab uh, but slightly different a slight variation here it's much more it looks much more fancy um, and th there are certain widgets that you won't find in your jupt notebook um, like for instance if you look at uh, the mini item which is there um, but well, there's the logo that you won't see in jupt notebook here um, but you also won't see those two buttons the code and the text button right if you remember in in, in, in Google, sorry about that, in, uh, this is dead now, in, in Jupyter Notebook, in here, for us to specify that this is Markdown, Markdown list, Markdown list two. For us to specify that this is Markdown, if I don't specify right now by default, what this thing thinks is that I'm, I'm, I'm writing Python code and it will show that it's an error, right? I have to explicitly state it that this is Markdown by clicking Markdown here. And then when I run this, it's going to render Markdown. Um, if you go to Google Colab, right, call.research.google.com or something, um, Colab, not code, Colab.research.google.com, <clears throat> um, what you will notice is that um, uh, instead of and this is a familiar site here, but I just say I want to create a new notebook or something. But what, what you get instead of that drop down menu with, with the different options, and one of which is Markdown, you have text and code, right? So the thing will load, um, and then you have this interface, which is somewhat different from, from notebook, right? Somewhat different, but, but it's not very different, right? So the way that I specify that this has to be text, is I say text and then this will be marked down, heading, heading one. So it's slightly different. In certain instances, you might want to push this on top here. Um, I'm not really happy with the um, user experience here. You just use the arrows to push around the cells, right? If you want to organize them appropriately, right? Um, and then you can do this usual things like uh, be able to write Python code um, and then uh, by you, the, the, the only difference here is that when it's executing, you see this spinner here, right? Taking quite a bit of time here, I'm not sure why. Um, seeing as this is very basic code here. I guess because it's initializing, if you can see on top here. Uh, but once this is executed, I'll see the result, right? I can do fancy things like uh, create functions, for instance, like uh, add to or something, right? Uh, where I have um, var1 and var2 or something, var2, then I'll say uh, return uh, var1 plus var2 or something. Um, so I'll create this function and then I'll be able to run this function here. And in fact, I can autocomplete also because it's, it's now recognized and then I can say what is I don't know what one plus two is, but maybe it's three or something. And then I'll get, um, I get the three here, right? So the idea is the same. If you notice there's some subtle similarities, right? Um, well, the number of similarities, subtle differences, or I suppose, I don't know. But what you notice by default, just like in here, default cell is code, right? Just like here, default cell is code. You must explicitly tell it that what you want is you want to create text, not code, text. And you notice the, the, the toolbar that comes up on top of your cell, in Google Colab, is dependent on what you're creating, right? Code, text. This is kind of interesting. In fact, Google Colab is much, much easier to work with if you notice, right? If I want to create lists, I can just click. And there we go. You don't have to type markdown. Like, but I think you can type also. Um, I, I don't know if this is making sense to people. Uh, some other useful things that I think people might find particularly useful, observe, right? Question is if you're working in the cloud, yeah? And you wish to, to work with data files. Uh, and I think this is the single most important piece of advice related to what we're going to be doing, right? How do you refer to data, right? So there's a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, I do believe you can, uh, hmm, I think you can, is it from 
כל ה... זיפ בגוגו, אימפורט, פייר, אפלוד, אז אני לא יודע. זה יכול להיות אני לא יודע. אימפורט. אני לא יודע אם זה או משהו, פייר, אפלוד, לא. Uh, I'm just going to look this up, Google Colab file upload. And these things are part of uh, the, if you got, I, I went out of my way here, right? They are frequently asked questions right within Colab. So you can say file upload, upload or something, upload. Let's see if we can. I guess not, we can look it up, we know else fails. Is it google.colab or colab.google or something, I don't know. Um, so from Google, not colab, but from, I don't know, I don't want the drive part here. It's, it turns out this is old, right? File, upload, file. This is, you can now easily mount, uh, you can easily mount uh, your drive, I'll, I'll show us just now. So this is, this is when you want to, um, this is when you want to upload files.upload. So from google.colab import files, right? So from, not colab, but from google.colab import up files, I think, right? Once you do that, you should be able to run all this according to that source here. Once you do that, you can now say, uh, the input, right? Input is equal to files dot. Dot upload. So once you do that, it will bring up a nice button that you 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 click, right? So if we're trying to replicate what I was doing here, right? I'm trying to do what I was doing here, where I imported these files using this file here. What I would do is. Uh, uh, so I've created a, a variable here that's going to hold the file. And then I will just choose to navigate to the location of the file. So um, I, will, I will just uh, go to where the file is located on my local machine and just say, uh, I want to go to projects, work 2021 in here, in here, and then I'll choose this, this file here, the CSV file. Right? And once I, once I import it, obviously, I have access to this as a variable now, right? And then I could, um, I could, uh, I could say um, import pandas, right, as pd, um, and then say uh, the input pd or something is equal to pd.read csv, right? And then I'll say the input. And then I'll say the separator here is equal to uh, is equal to the pipe symbol. Hopefully, it should be able to work here. So now I have access as uh, what the what is this now? I wonder if this what is invalid file path? No, it's not invalid. Input. I guess I'll have to, I'll have to refer to it differently or something. It's a dictionary, okay. I'm wondering why, okay. I'm wondering why, uh, Oh, sorry about that. I see what this, this has done. I don't know if you can see this, but, and I hate it. So what this has done is because of the way I've imported it, right? Um, so it's a key value pair where the, um, the key is the name of the file and then I have access to the data. Uh, so this would be, if I come here and say type, that should be what, I, I, what I'm looking for here. 
So, okay, it's fine. So hopefully now if I say PD dot, uh, say var input file is equal to PD dot read CSV. Oh, okay. Let's see if this is, I've never used the read tip. I've never used, uh, I've never read a file like this directory. So let's see if this will work. Hope it should be able to work. Nothing, no. Maybe, maybe there's a dot read, read, it should be another way to read the data here, let's see. Anyway, I've, uh, I've never read this data like this, which is, uh, let's, let's look at bytes, let's look at, uh, uh, Bytes object. Yeah, it appears you have to, this is a thing here, you might have to convert it the same way. It's, it's, it looks like such such a, uh, a very weird way of, uh, of casting data back to a form that you can easily read, right? That's sad. Anyway, just so the, the key thing here is uh, I was trying to showcase, right? I was trying to showcase how you, how you, um, how you get to gain access to external data, right? Uh, this is, so the data in this case would be this. Hopefully this works, bytes data. Okay, we'll just leave it at S or something. Um, okay, this data, and then this would be our, our file that we want, right? Hopefully this works. But even if it doesn't work, that's fine. I'll look it up later on. I'm just trying to, trying to, but we're just trying to look at different ways, right? So it's, it's worked. We're looking at different ways in which we, we, we can read data from Google Colab. It's much easier with the local, I mean, it's not that hard uh, with, with, with the local instance of Jupyter Notebook, but when working with Colab and you want to access something else on your computer, is what we're doing here. So you notice that uh, we now have access to a Pandas data frame here, right? Um, and we can pretty much do what we're doing to it earlier, right? So we can just say plot here and then try and see exactly what it's going to do here. But before we plot, oh. if you've noticed with uh, Google Colab, the interesting thing is you don't have to import matplotlib, right? When we tried to plot here without matplotlib, we couldn't see anything. We could see an object, right, that it was a plot object, right? We could see this, but we couldn't see the output up until we use the matplotlib library. But with Colab, I guess, uh, I guess this is done by default for you. <clears throat> but the other way, right? The other way that I, my workflow, when I'm working using Colab, I refer to data in Google Drive. And, and it turns out that <clears throat> referring to data in Google Drive is not really that hard. So observe, let's say, hypothetically speaking, right? We are working with, uh, we, we, the data set we are working with here is not on the local machine, but is on Google Drive. Question is, how exactly do we refer to that? Well. You have to mount drive first, but you need to make sure first that the data you want is actually um, is actually in drive. So assuming it's in drive, which it should be, by the way, if you also assigned email emails, you you have unlimited space. I don't know if you or oh, almost unlimited space anyway. Um, so you're paying for that, you might as well use that. But imagine a situation where I have data in some directory in drive, right? And I'm going to put it, uh, I'm going to put it in, do I have, do I have the shared drive here? So I'm, I'm going to attempt to put it in here. Okay, I'll put it in code. 
So imagine, obviously, the first thing you have to do is you import this CSV, right? So we're going to assume that this CSV file is um, is um, is located in your drive, right? So, so you have caller. The first thing you have to do, things have become much easier. In the past, this would be a tedious process, right, where you import certain packages. But now, all you have to do is you expand this, and then you go to files, right? And then you mount, mount drive. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mount, this is assuming you are logged on as you're using Colab. You should be logged on actually. What you're doing here is you're mounting the, the Google Drive that's associated with this account. So in this case, I'm logged on using my own assigned email address. So everything I'm accessing is this stuff here. Everything that you're seeing here, I have access to, right? And what I do myself is I, I have uh, showcase, well, just to showcase something here. I actually have uh, data sets, right? I have data sets, massive data sets, like Zambia Daily Mail data sets that I, I've been wanting to work with. So with these things here, these are high resolution files, by the way, with these things here, I can, I can analyze them right in the cloud, right? I can analyze all of these things right in the cloud, which makes life a lot easier. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, the usual, you don't have to go about talking about advantages of uh, cloud, cloud-based services. So I've mounted this, right? And uh, so once, once you mount this, let me just mount this thing. It was supposed to be, I wanted to showcase something. I'm just going to mount it again. I don't know if it, um, I don't know if it, uh, it's connecting. I don't know if it showed, it showed the, the part where you can copy. Uh, you can, you have a shortcut, right? You copy the link to your drive, the, the root. Um, the root location to your drive. I'm just going to refresh this just to see. So as I'm doing this, uh, just uh, a question to find out if this is making sense, if people are following through, especially with Colab. Uh, I'm following. Okay. Not knowing about the rest. All right. So I'm just going to mount this, right? And then connect to drive. And then uh, should be a way of copying. It's an easier way of copying this. I'm, I'm wondering why I can't see the, oh, there we go, it came back, it just appeared here. So you see this uh, vertical menu option here? You say copy path, right? And you notice that, uh, you have access to this, this is it, right? This is your route once you mount your drive. Um, and so the, the, uh, this is where the bash scripting might become useful, right? So if, if I'm uncertain as to the names, or if you have a, a really complex structure, not really complex, but you, you, have, you have your Google Drive structured in, in such a way, like if you look at, at me, for instance, I have a number of shared drives, right? I have a number of, uh, a number of, uh, a number of uh, subdirectories in my drive directory itself. So for me to make sense of where exactly the data is, I might have to do a bit of shell scripting, right? So this is where this comes in handy. So I'll list here and try and see, you notice that I have access to my drive and shared drives. But I know that the data I want is in my drive, right? So I'll, I'll issue another uh, command here and then I'll say my drive, right? And I know from here, that uh, what I'm looking for is, because I've mastered the, the thing actually, my drive, uh, I organize it in a certain way. I, I know it's in teaching. Um, and then in teaching, I have uh, a partic particular year, which is 2021. In 2021, I have CSC 57. I have this directory here. Miscellaneous, UNSA 21, MSC, and there's autocomplete available. Again, if I, if I do a list as well, I, I know that what I want is in, in miscellaneous auxiliary resources, right? Again, if I enter this, I will then have access to, I guess it's code, 
I should have put it in data set not code, but that's fine also. Um, and then it's here. So this is the file I want, right? Because I found I found the location of the file, which is here. What I could do now is is in the next line here, I'll run um, I'll run another shell command. This time around, I'll just say I want to do a cut, right? I want to view the source of this file here, CSV file. Once I enter this, I should be able to see, um, I should be able to see the content. Now this is pretty much the same thing we were doing before, only that this time around I'm doing it in the cloud, right? I, I don't need uh, a, a, an instance of, of Drupal notebook running here. Um, I, I'm doing everything in the cloud and I can do the usual stuff where now that I know that this is a file, I will say, okay, fine. Um, I will copy the complete path here. Uh, come down here and say, I want to import pandas as PD, and then we'll, so, we'll stop abusing cells, we'll do everything all at once. And then um, I'll say var input file collab or something is equal to PD dot read CSV. And then this is what we have here. I'll say the separator is a type symbol, right? Um, now that I have access to, it's not sep or it's separator, sep. Um, now that I have access to the variable, right, which clearly works, I can make use of this variable and do the same exact thing. <clears throat> so you notice this is a, is a pandas data frame now, right? Um, and, and I can, I can, I can now do whatever, whatever operation uh, is valid on a pandas data frame, like I can check the structure of the frame itself. I can inspect it and just take a peek at the first two records. I can take a peek at the last two records if I want, right? Um, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can filter records and we'll look at these things at a later stage, they'll make sense. But I'm just trying to showcase, so far, showcase that we can do the same things we were doing before. I can plot also. Um, so, so essentially what I was saying is, well, one of the useful tricks when you're working with Colab, everything is the same as when you're using Jupyter Notebook running local on your machine. But a thing that you're going to find useful is how to make reference to data. Now there's something very disturbing, right, about uh, Colab. If you're, if you're wanting to use data, not from, not using Google, Google Drive like I am, but let's say you want to upload, upload it from within here, for instance, there's an option, by the way, right? You can, you can upload it from here, right? You notice this? I don't know if you can see this. I can upload it direct, but it turns out that this, the, the, once the session ends, you won't have access to that data, right? It's gone which is why it becomes useful for you to refer to it uh, via Google Drive or something, because you know that this is persistent. Uh, any, any thoughts or, uh, I, don't, I don't know if people, uh, has anybody, is anyone willing to show us their collab? No need for installation with collab, all you do is you go to collab.research.google.com, right? Any volunteers? Maybe we can, Let's let's have someone. I'm going to unshare my screen. Let's have uh, let's have someone. Just uh, I don't know who's still active here, but let's have someone go to collab.research.google.com and then let's try and see if we can uh, we can have you do um, we can have you go through the workflow that I just showcased. Let's let's. Volunteers? Hello? I can share my screen. Yes, please. That's, that would be nice.
as, as Mwemba is sharing her screen, are there any thoughts, maybe something that you're finding difficult or, um, I don't know, uh, things that you, you probably, uh, I, I want to insist that maybe between now and Monday, if you can, and this works best if you do it today, by the way, if you can get this to work uh, so that when we start, the, the part we're doing next, right, is going to be somewhat more hands-on. Like when we start looking at Python, it would be nice if you could practice those things so that they make more sense. Yeah, all right. Maybe so as a starting point, what I've done is I'm, I'm going to paste a, a publicly available link. I don't know if you can see that. So if you go to that link, you will find that data set. Let's try and see if we can work with the same data set. I think you've unshared your screen. Oh, I think we lost Moon by here. I don't know if uh, I don't know if she's going to rejoin. But uh, are, are there any? As we are waiting for her, are there any? Uh, questions that people might have, I and mean, I know it's, oh, she's back, right. Um, as she's setting up, do people have any any questions or something? Uh, I know it's, it's one of those trivial things, but uh -huh. I usually like it when we're all on the same page. I think it works better, and I have a feeling this is much better than starting with uh, the models, the data mining models, and then the programming part, because I think there's certain portions where we need to showcase a few examples or something. All right, so I'm just, I shared, um, okay, Did, have you seen the link in the chat? Um. No, oh, yeah. I so haven't seen it. I think, I think you logged out because you went offline. I've just shared it again. Uh, I never I'll could understand why it. Google Google Meet works this way, right? Where your messages disappear once you log out of them. Right. So what I want us to do is let's download that. Now I know it sounds very weird, right? Oh, but you don't have to download it. Maybe just drag it to whatever location you want in your in your in your drive. If you want, you can put it in the root itself. Or maybe in one of your folders, if you have a folder in in your my drive or something. Or if you have a dedicated, uh, just ex expand the my drive the the arrow. Just click I on think the, I'll just drag it here. Yeah, just drag it there. Yeah. How do I drag it? How do I drag it? Just a minute. Just drag it to where it says my drive. I think you should be able to work. Mm, it's this one. Mm, did it copy? Uh, so I, I don't know about the others, but I can't see. It looks like your arrow is just static. I can't see. Just see. I can't see what's happening here. Uh, I don't. Hello? Uh, hello. So I'm, I'm not sure about the, the others, but I, ca I can't, I don't know if it's your connection member, but I can't, uh, I, I can't seem to, oh, she's disconnected. I think she has connection issues. That's okay. Uh, oh, she's still online, I think.
gone. Anyway, uh, I don't know if we're going to manage, but uh, just to, again, to ask if people have any, we're going to try one more time to see if she can manage. Ah, welcome back. Can you try ag again? I, you're having connect connection issues, is it? Hello? Hello, Doc? Yes, hi. Uh, can you reshare again? Are you having connectivity issues or something? Okay. Uh, Any any luck, Wemba? Okay. I think we are having connect, connection issues. Uh, or maybe she is. I, I hear some clucking here. I'm almost thinking that maybe it's not the connection issues working, but. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear us, Munda? Hello? Is it just me or um, is everybody else not hearing what Munda is saying? I also can't hear anything, but I can hear typing on the keyboard. Yeah, yeah I thought so as well. Uh, I think a bit of it. Okay, that's fine. Is there maybe anybody else who is willing to try this out? There? Yeah, there's a bit of an issue on your side, Mwim, but I think your connection is bad. Uh, we can't hear you anymore. Oh, Derek is sharing, okay. Right. Hello? Let's... Yeah, I think your connection is really bad, Mwim. So Derek has uh, volunteered to to share, let's, and she's gone. All right, so maybe we can, Derek, we can start by moving, if you can drag that to maybe your drive or something, I don't know. If, if it can't work, then I suppose you need to create, you need to drag it in one of the folders. I don't know if uh, that should work in one, so if there's a subfolder. So you want to, maybe you should have expanded that and then, uh, or expand the drive and then, yeah. And then try and move that to maybe, oh, I don't know, you, you don't use a, uh, <laughs> maybe move it to classroom or something, I don't know. I don't know if it will work if you drag it to classroom. You need to drag that, uh, shared file, I think. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's like it's adding a show, that's fine. So, uh, right, I'm wondering what grade five means here, but, but so now, um, I don't know if your microphone is, can be unmuted, Derek, I think we are not getting you. Let's try and see if you can, Maybe you can unmute your microphone and then we can, uh, excellent. So now let's go to your, uh, your call, up, call up file you created. Where did I find? <laughs> there, yeah. it is. yes, right. And then you see the, to your, to your left there, top left, there's, there's that menu icon. Click on that, no, after, before called. No, the, just yeah. before called right below to the vertical strip there, you have a search icon and then right on top is what looks like a, a list or just click that. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then you scroll down to the last icon, which is files, right below, not section, but right, right below. below, after the code icon, below. yes. Mm -hmm. So when you click that, right, it's going to bring up just click on that and then it's going to bring up, uh, it's going to tell you it's connecting to a runtime, 
to enable file browsing. Once that is done, once that is activated, um, we can then mount your drive. Uh, so for now, if you notice, to your, it, it was connecting, now it's initializing to your left there, it says initializing. Yeah, now I'm connected. Yeah, and then just click on the last icon, the Google Drive icon. If you hoover over it, you notice that, uh, if you just hoover over it, you notice that it says mount drive. Then last one, if you just hoover over it, the last one to your right, yeah. You notice that it is- Right set, click or? Left click. So it's going to mount the drive and then just say connect to Google Drive. Once you do that, it's gonna take a bit of time, you will see besides sample data, there'll be another folder that will pop up, the drive folder. Uh, so you just have to wait oh, for- In this account, just give me two accounts, I've got this one and the other one. Oh, okay. For now, Probably the mail you sent to me went to the other one, I, I suppose. Ah, I see, right. Looks like it's taking time. So which one do you propose, which one do you advise, the person one or the Unza one? Well, so the beauty with the Unza one, right, once you get to a stage where you're working with large data, if you do work on projects with large data, some of the projects will involve large data. Unza has, uh, technically speaking, you have unlimited space with your Unza assigned in your account. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, but, I advise that. But, but, with the Unza one. Yeah. But sometimes maybe you, you've become accustomed to using your personal account. You can also use your personal account. Uh, all right, so, okay, okay. so you, you can Just run give me to run this cell to mount. Yeah, so you can, I guess you can run that. This is, this is, um, okay, this is, um, so you need to click that to authorize it. It's a bit weird here. I guess maybe because I'm using my G Suite. So yeah, you need to copy that thing there. Is that your personal? I see you have 64. Is this a paid, you, is this a paid for account? You, you, you have extra space, right? I saw 64 mm, GPS. Space. 64. Yeah, right below there. It says 69.47 GB at the bottom there, disk. You see that? Oh, 67 GBS. That's enough. So I can't <laughs> yeah. with it. You maybe you you, you, uh, you you paid for space, I'm sure. Anyway, that's fine. Yeah, probably a lot of things they do on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Um all right, so let's see if we can copy the the code that you can paste there. Okay, you know what? I'll use the the one that I'm familiar with. The personal one, the only one I haven't used it so far. Okay. My internet is slow. All right, so just copy that. I've copied everything. Yeah. Where then, was it supposed to test? Yeah. Yes. Then I enter what? Uh, I think just press enter. Yeah, All right. So, so it's mount, yeah. So it's mounted. So what? What we can do now, right? Is um, just uh, click. You see that code button on top there? There's code and text. Click code. Yeah. Yep. Next. Yeah, so now you you type exclamation mark ls, so we want to list, list what is in your drive. Space and then just copy content slash drive. Where you, you have mounted at, just copy that path. Without the last, uh, remove the last, yeah, and then uh, run again. I wanted to press on enter. <laughs> oh, actually you can press 
uh, shift enter. That's a shortcut. So you oh, see now have my enter. drive. So right in front of drive, what you can do is uh, another forward slash and then type my drive. In fact, it auto completes also. So in, in front, front of what? In front of that contents slash drive, type slash and then my drive. And then press enter, uh, shift enter or press the, uh, the play button again. There we go. And then so you can recursively go until we know we put it in classroom. So you can press another slash and then say class. I've put two now. I've put two. Okay. I'll go with this one. Oh, yeah. So, so because I that's, think I copied once. Yeah, you, you copy the shortcut because that was shared. So you have it direct. But remove the forward slash now because that's, a, that's not a directory. It's, actual, it's an actual file. So the, the, for, the last, yeah. Right, so what we can do now, right, is uh, copy that entire command and then uh, create a new cell. So copy that, yes, just that. And then mm -hmm. click on that plus, plus. How do you create a new cell? Code. On top there, code text and then press top code. And then mm -hmm. exclamation mark. Yeah, exclamation mark and then cut and then paste that, and then play. All right, so it's, a, it's as easy as that. I mean, so um, clearly, and I remember Derek used to work with a number of Unix like operating systems and building departments, so clearly- Those days. Yeah, being a manager, uh, <laughs> you haven't forgotten about the, the, the show command. So, so this is the thing here. I mean, so you can run shell commands and then next week we get to a stage where we will be able to do some of the things I was showcasing, like plotting using matplotlib, but also playing around with a few Python commands also. Um, so I'm hoping that, I do hope that we will all get to a stage maybe between now and when we meet next. Oh, and next Monday is a, is a holiday here, right? Holiday, yeah. So, I'm trying to see if maybe, can we share, Joe, can we agree right now? Because we were supposed to have started, uh, we we're supposed to have started interacting uh, much, much earlier. I'd like to suggest something. I don't know what people think here. I don't know if people have plans for next Friday. So because Monday is a holiday, uh, I would like, because I know that the timetable says uh, it's Friday self-study. Um, if not Friday, then maybe, I know there's usually uh, a Seventh-day Adventist, so usually it's a bit of a problem. If that's an issue, maybe we can find, I feel bad that uh, we will skip a week. So I was thinking that maybe we can find a slot somewhere next week. Instead of missing Monday, we can still have a session. Anyway, something to think about, and then maybe we can, we can continue. We can chat, as, you can chat as a group and then um, we can maybe try and see if it works. If it doesn't work, that's fine also. But it would be nice if we couldn't, we could find the next week. All right, so I don't know if there are any questions or thoughts about, about this. Um, uh, we, we're almost at a stage where we'll be able to follow through with what will be going on with the practical examples being given, which, which, was, which is the, the goal of lecture series number two, actually. Um, so the next part is going to be the Python part, just a crash course introduction to Python. I, I, I would like to insist that, uh, or ask that you, uh, we make sure that you have um, a fully functional version of Python, or if you will prefer to work in Colab, make sure that you configure Colab so that uh, um, you configure it and you familiarize yourself with Colab so that we were able to work through some simple examples uh, using uh, some, some data structures that we're going to use often. All right, um, if there are no questions, then this is 2004. I know there's about- My hand is raised, Doc, my oh. hand is up. Oh yes, please. Yeah, the first item is then, um, Honest has requested that you share the link for this recorded session. Okay, yep. After the call, so that's the first item. The second question I think is around the, um, Okay, we have seen that we're able to connect to a file using Colab, and I'm sure even the other tools that we used, Jupyter. 
use, I mean, connecting to a file that is sitting on a, some file system. Are we able to connect to a database? Imagine your data is sitting on a database with this to call up or Jupyter. Are we able to have that connection? Yes, you are able to uh, have that connection. So there's, um, so I want to answer that question, something to think about here. But if you go back to your call-up, your call-up installation. I don't know if I'm still sharing or I stopped sharing. I'm not sure. Uh, I think you stopped. You can share again. Okay. Oh, OK. Or oh, I can share anyway. I'll showcase what I want to showcase. I'll share. OK. Go ahead. So, so you will notice that answer will be, so my response is twofold. The first part is I want to showcase, um, that's assuming, right? Because Python, just like any other language, we enable you connect to different data sources in different ways. Um, I find using pandas quite effective. And I want to answer that question in part because we discuss pandas in depth next, next week or when we meet next. But I want to answer that question by showcasing, I don't know if people can see my screen. Can, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so if you go to pandas, right? PD dot read, observe, right? You can read read from a clipboard. You can read from a CSV file. You can read from an Excel file. Uh, some of these files, I don't know what they're about. But if you scroll down, even JSON, right? If you scroll down, if in a Pico file, which is quite nice, SPSS, SQL, an SQL query, an SQL table, right? So there's, there's, there's really just by using the pandas uh, library, you can uh, read data from your database. And because Python is like any other programming language, you can establish a database connection as well and be able to read data from there. So yes, the answer is yes, you can. You can read data from anywhere, actually. Even, um, I mean, I know in the past we've, we've experimented with reading HTML, I think. Uh, so, uh, uh, like structured content like Wikipedia, for instance, you can easily read that data and, um, and be able to, to work with that. So yes, you can. Okay, thanks. Um, my next question, I don't know. Sorry, Tim, I seem to have a lot of questions. My next question is around the... So, between Colab and Jupyter, which one do you... Because when I look at what we have been going through, for yes. me, what I pick up is I can use any of the two. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, so the, the, the advantages to both, right? Uh, I'll start with an example. I'm planning a trip on this long long uh, long weekend and i know i'll find myself in a location where the internet is going to be sketchy but i still want to do a bit of work because this work i'm doing that involves me to use uh, that will require me to use Jupyter notebook i will i can't use collab then connection is not going to be stable so i will need an offline version Jupyter notebook right so it's it's a it's a usual advantages of cloud-based services over you know non-cloud-based services or something the thing I like about uh, Colab, right? So that's the advantage of like uh, an offline version, like a local version of Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab. The thing with Colab is you have everything well organized in the cloud. You, you won't have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, having something installed on your computer. And I do this a lot because the computer I use at home is different from the machine, uh, the desktop that I have at work, right? All I do is I log in and I have access to everything. My data sets are in uh, Google Drive. Uh, in fact, everything in Google Drive, including these call-ups, right? Uh, the, the, the notebooks that I'm creating here. So it's, um, it depends on, on what your workflow is, is, is like. Um, you will realize that uh, there are some restrictions with call-up when you start working on problems that are computationally intensive. So if you need additional computing resources, I can get away with certain things because my computer has 4 GB of RAM, right? Uh, unfortunately, if you want additional resources in Colab, you'd have to pay a little bit of extra money. So that's another disadvantage. But for most of the things we're going to be doing, 
uh, collab should suffice, and I do encourage collab, but in instances where you don't have the internet and you still want to work, um, as a fallback plan, I strongly encourage that you also have uh, um, an offline, I mean, you also have an installation of either Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook. I hope that answers your question. It does, yeah, it does. Okay, the, the next point is concerning the paper that you had sent you. I've yes, tried yes. in the course of the lecture, I've tried to search through my not my emails. I don't seem to find all the emails that came from you. I put them in one folder. Is it okay. possible that you can send that email for the sake yes, of those uh, of us yes. who wouldn't? Yes, it's very much possible. I'm actually forwarding it just now to the entire mailing list. So yeah, uh, just rescinding it just now. So I'm putting you know, the trial uh, paper review. All right. Um, just remember that uh, as part of this recording, there's, there's, um, there's this part here, and I'll, I'll share also this, this slide deck. There's this part here, which uh, as you're preparing, it's nice to uh, think of this breakdown here, right? 25% for accuracy, 25% coverage, 10, uh, uh, percentage for arguments, presentation, and reflection as well. All right. Uh, any any other thoughts? Or are there any other questions? Okay. So in closing, I just wanted to mention that just to tell us that the next time we are meeting, um, uh, yeah, if we won't meet next week, then it's after next week. We are going to, if we meet next week, that would be nice though. Friday would be nice if we don't have Adventists, but if we do maybe, even a weekend would be nice. Right? But so, um, uh, the next time we meet, we are discussing uh, just getting started with Python. It's going to be similar to what we did today where I prefer for it to, now in as much as I can go through the things here, um, I think having a back and forth like we did today, especially for hands-on type sessions, is going to be much more useful than me doing doing the things myself. I've, I've come to learn that uh, if we we have people work through certain tasks, right? You share a screen and you, you work through specific tasks, then then at least we get to a stage where everybody is able to is able to work with these these tools we're going to be using. Uh, I think I know it can be time consuming, but but. Uh, and the beauty is uh, we will get to a stage where everyone will know how to use these tools, so it won't really be, um, it won't really be that much uh, time consuming as it has been or as it will the next time we meet as well. So, uh, so yeah, we'll look at getting started with Python and then hopefully transition to part four also, where we look at the specific core libraries. Now, when we're looking at the core libraries, all we're doing is really just how to install and how to use them. Um, and it turns out once you learn how to use one or two libraries or packages, um, using the others is, is the same, right? Import pandas as PD. From pandas, uh, import X, right? Uh, so the, the usual, the usual stuff, it's, it's not that hard. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Unless if there are any other uh, questions, then I will say, I will see you when you see me. Hopefully, Honest will be able to tell us if the group wants us to meet either on Friday next week or the weekend. If not, then I'll see you Monday after next. Uh, thank you. Oh, there's a there's a hand from uh, Mwemba, sorry. I don't know if uh, No, I don't, it's not a hand. Okay, all right, thanks. No okay, uh, thanks a lot then, uh, good night. All right, good night. Thank you.